It's like it needs Hello to everyone, be. thank you all for coming to the CS Club's uh, first alumni talk this year. Um, we've had a few talks, but first alumni talk. So, um, John is an engineering manager at Blue Apron, and he's worked at eBay. Uh, he's from the class of 2008, just all the slides, right, right there. But, um, he's like, where are we going to say? But, uh, uh, he, he's a valuable resource, mainly because he's had the same education as you guys have had. Um, although it was a while ago, like different class size from what we talked about that last night. Um, and I'm sure he'll tell all about that. Um, but I'm just going to ask that people really listen to John because we've, we've listened to people before, but we haven't heard someone who's had you know our experience, right? And this is our chance to see. Well, here's an SU grad, um, several years out, you know, what, uh, eight years after taking after graduating from SU. You know, what was his career like and how things have been for him. And I think that'll be a really exciting opportunity for all of us here. So um, please give a warm welcome to John. Um, thank you, Zayad, and thanks to the club for hosting me. Um, this is, it's kind of interesting. I haven't been back to Seattle in uh, three years at least, and back probably back on campus in like five years, so it's been kind of uh, nice to see how things have changed. Um, uh, so said, I'm currently an engineering manager at Blue Apron. Um, how many people have heard of Blue Apron? Pretty good. Sweet. We're doing, our, we're doing a good job. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what I do there in a minute. I uh, graduated in 08, uh, and if you want to find me online, uh, just at KleinJJ on whatever <coughs> platform you want to use. Um, so real quick, things that uh, I'm going to talk about today. Uh, a few lessons that I've kind of learned through my career, specifically around software development and engineering, uh, kind of some practical tips, hopefully, that for those of you that are kind of going to be going and looking for internships or jobs this coming year. So how many people are seniors in this year last year? Sweet. So this will be really helpful. How many people have like already applied or started applying for jobs and internships? Excellent. Uh, that's good. So hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of just my thoughts on where the industry is moving and uh, you know kind of what's coming up you know the next 10, 15, 20 years that are going to be the big things through your careers and you know mine going forward. Um, so just kind of background about me. Uh, that was me before I grew up on my hair uh, when I graduated in 2008. Uh, my senior project was with Ariva Transmission Distribution, kind of working on like a mobile web app to help their people kind of do what they needed to do, which was kind of Interesting in that that was like before the iPhone launched, and so in retrospect, it was like very far ahead. But at the time, it was just kind of that was what we we're doing, because that's how it worked, and um, that was the way to do it. Now, while I was in school, I worked for IT. Uh, I led an orientation um, for a new student orientation, and then also was involved with the search and treatment at Air Force ROTC. Uh, after I graduated, I got an MBA from uh, Arizona State in 2011 and went into the Air Force uh, for three years and kind of did a lot of administrative work. Uh, most of the technical work was around uh, kind of building out this workflow in an access and uh, did a little bit of C-sharp with that. Uh, afterwards, uh, I went to work for Homeland Security and as a long-range radar engineer, which was kind of interesting, so long-range radar systems are like those big white domes, if you've ever seen them kind of around airports or not always around airports. Uh, with basically these big fixed systems. And there was a big transition from going to analog to digital during the time that I worked there. And so it was really interesting kind of seeing software, uh, really the impact of software, being able to utilize these systems and the data that came back more often. Uh, and I also did some data analysis um, using a little bit of Python on some of that data and how we could, how the government could better utilize it. Uh, in that time, I also did a bunch of freelance software development, mostly around web and mobile. Uh, focusing a lot more on Android just because it was easy to do a new job and uh, doing some web work as well. And then I kind of got into the tech industry in a more formal way um, at eBay. And I started as a full stack engineer and then moved into the lead role on the homepage team. So kind of whatever shows up when you type in eBay.com, that's what my team built. Uh, there's a feed product right now, so kind of infinite scrolling, search results. One of the first projects I worked on was expanding that into support different kinds of updates. And then kind of over the next couple of years, just a bunch of different iterations and improving that product and adding curation tools and 
for our content platform or content team that would just find cool stuff on eBay and feature it on the homepage. So like building tools for them to help, help them do that. Uh, and kind of here the tech stack was uh, Java and that ecosystem. We started to transition to Node.js uh, and then kind of all the front end web stuff, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Uh, and then in August, I switched over to Blue Apron, where I'm at now. Uh, and I'm leading the growth team, which focuses on pretty much everything related to customer acquisition. So that's all of our marketing content, emails, our tracking analytics platform, our referral program, all the software that needs to get built to help that work. That's what my team does. Uh, and our tech stack is Ruby and Rails, JavaScript, and then we have you know, kind of a handful of different front-end clients. Um, I guess kind of the interesting theme in my career has been I've, I've worked in a few different places, and it took me a while to get into kind of the actual like tech industry in, the, in a formal sense. But through that, I've seen software in a bunch of different places through kind of the fast, really fast-paced web and mobile space where you're able to iterate and change things a lot more quickly to kind of these radar systems where you, we update them once every 40 years. And so kind of the software and how you write software for those systems is very different than tech. And so it's been kind of a, an interesting experience kind of balancing all these different, different areas of software. Uh, and so here are a few lessons that I've learned from that. Uh, the first one, software development is way more about people than it is about actually writing software or solving problems. And there's an interesting uh, law, Conway's Law, uh, which basically says that anytime you're building software or building a system, the design and architecture of that system is going to be more influenced by the design and your organization structure than what you're actually trying to do with that software. And kind of how that's played out, um, you will take eBay and Blue Apron. So eBay, big company, uh, you know, been around for 21 years now. Very well structured. It's a very kind of bureaucratic company. There's 5,000 engineers that are writing millions of lines of code every year. And because of that, because it does make, you know, it's a 70 billion dollar business. There's a lot of processes in place to make sure that teams are, you know, kind of focused on exactly this one particular part. My team was focused only on the home page and no other part of eBay, just the home page. Um, you know, there were teams that were built working on search, and there were several teams on that, you know, between database and like the actual core search algorithm and the search front end. Uh, so, you know, all of these processes in place to make sure that all the code that got written was like checked, wasn't going to hurt the business, everything went through these processes. It was very formulated and structured. And that's how the architecture went as well with the software. Uh, you know, it's so big, nobody has a real picture of the whole system, right? You can understand maybe a piece of it, but it's way too big to understand how everything kind of fits together. And change that to Blue Apron. So Blue Apron, we have about 60 engineers that are writing thousands of lines of code. Uh, we have one application, more or less, at this point. Uh, and as we're growing as a business, both in terms of like money and revenue and in terms of people, we're starting to grow out that application to a point where you know the technology doesn't work anymore, and so now we're kind of structuring out this more distributed architecture that follows kind of how the company's built. All the systems are really tightly coupled. That just happens because it's one application. It's kind of how you go and build things in that sense. Uh, it's pretty easy for people to know kind of how everything fits together and how everything works because you know at the end of the day it's not that big of a project, uh, and the main focus. Of, you know, as with any startup, is how fast can we get things delivered? How can we, you know, change things and iterate and meet our customers' needs as quickly as possible? And so, pretty much our entire processes and workflows are all built around how can we get stuff out to the end user first. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting change for me, going like eBay, going from eBay where it's like very well structured, a lot of documentation, to Blue Apron where, uh, you know, it's a lot more, uh, not so much structured, I guess. Um, so the other thing too, most software, you know, there's kind of this like image of like the, the lone software developer, you know, you just kind of like go and code on something and that happens, but that's generally not the case. The large majority of software developers that work in the industry are working on a team. You're not really writing code by yourself. And, uh, you know, you're generally doing something like this, uh, this is me at eBay. Um, where you're working with someone and you're writing code, but ultimately that code becomes the responsibility of the team and someone else is gonna come along and maintain that. And so it's really important that 
you know, the code that you write is kind of a reflection of you, right? It's how you're interpreting a specific problem, how you think something should be designed, and everyone has their own opinions on that, and, you know, they're not necessarily right or wrong, but a very important part of writing software is being able to communicate your thoughts in a way that someone else can come back at a later point in time and be able to understand what you were thinking and change it or modify it or do something with it. And that's just important that like part of code that writes, writing code that can be understood by other people is just as important as writing code that is correct. Uh, which kind of goes into the next lesson, your code is not your baby. What I mean by that is, while your code is kind of a reflection, while your code is a reflection of you, uh, it's not necessarily a reflection of you as a person or your capabilities. Uh, how many people have done something around code review? Like have ever done code review at all? Great. So code review is an industry standard practice where essentially you write code and then other people on your team look at the changes that you made and give you tips or advice on how to change it or fix it. Um, you know, so that it kind of comes to this better whole picture. And one of the first things that I that happened when I went to eBay, so eBay was the first time that I started working somewhere that had code review, was uh, it was very, it took me a while to not take those changes personally. So someone would say, hey, you did this, you know, maybe not in the best way, here's a better way you could have done it, or why did you do things this way? And I kind of, you know, my initial reaction was like a very defensive, like, hey, I wrote this because I thought that was the right way and that was the one way to do things. But it's not software like everyone thinks differently. And so, you know, your code isn't necessarily a reflection of you or your own personality or your own capabilities. Um, and particularly when you get into code review, you know, it's a really great opportunity. You know, once you start realizing that it's not personal and start treating it as a learning experience, it's one of the best ways to actually learn how to become a better software developer. Because you have people literally telling you, hey, here's what you did, and here's maybe a better way, or some way that you didn't think of, or you know, looking at something from a different perspective. And so it's really helpful, it's a really great way to learn. Um, and if you're ever in a position, you know, as you're interviewing with all these companies over the next few months, you know, talk to them about how they work together, talk to them about how they collaborate. And if it's not this environment where code review is kind of a learning opportunity, <laughs> or you don't have that opportunity to like, get some actual feedback on what you're doing, like find a different team. I think it's, like, that's one of the best ways to become a better developer is to get that feedback. Uh, lesson number three. Um, how many people have done web development in a general sense, either like in class or on your own on the side? How many people have used a front-end framework, like JavaScript, like Ember or React? Okay, cool. So you all maybe have a sense of this. Front-end web development is really great right now, and it's also really terrible all at the same time. Uh, there's never been kind of more capabilities or more frameworks or um, kind of a way to understand front-end web development ever in the history of software. Uh, but those capabilities and those frameworks are not evenly distributed. And as a front-end web developer, you kind of have to know all of these different edge cases. And so here's a, here's a great example. Um, 1998 was kind of the height of the original browser war, so like Internet Explorer and you know, Netscape Navigator were kind of fighting over features and were going kind of had very different fundamental ideas about how to do web browsers. So Internet Explorer was, you know, had really deep hooks into the operating system, which allowed for some greater features. Netscape was kind of going more of like let's follow standards and kind of had these general practices. And that worked for a while, uh, you know, they, you know, around 2000, 2001, they started consolidating, and there was a little bit better. Uh, but then after kind of the rate in the last 10 years or so, it's just totally changed. And so every platform is trying to introduce new features that allow for kind of different things. Safari, Chrome, and Edge are all competing for, you know, have different versions of possibly the same APIs. Uh, and that's not including kind of all the different features you get on mobile and desktop. You know, particularly the trend on mobile is to make web browsers be able to hook more deeply into the system so that you can write a web app that feels like a native app, which is really great from a user perspective. But as a developer, and as a software engineer, there's a lot more that you have to think about. And so this is a really fun chart. So I took this screenshot the other day of a website called Can I Use, which just tells you what features of HTML5 spec are available and supported in different browsers. And so green is supported, yellow is like kind of supported, meaning 
Uh, it doesn't totally work where you have to use some sort of prefix that's non-standard, and red means it's not supported. And so as you can see, like pretty much having to know all of these and develop software around all of these, you know, is, gets tricky. It gets very complicated. So that's one of the bad things about it. One of the great things about it uh, is I'll get to that in, I guess, another slide. Another challenge, too, with web development in particular is on mobile. Um, so this is uh, essentially a chart of the network, just the network latency when you, on a mobile device, when you request a web resource. So uh, your phone you know, made a request, uh, in this case, to Bloomberg.com. Um, there's a part where it has to do the DNS lookup, so figuring out you know, what IP address is serving Bloomberg.com, actually connecting to that server, making the request saying, hey, give me this content, and then actually getting that content back. And uh, HSPA and HSPA plus LTE are just two different web uh, connection, mobile connection technologies. Uh, LTE is like 4G, HSPA is 2G, 3G. Um, and essentially the difference between those two technologies, which your phone can kind of hop between based just totally depending on what the network conditions are, you know, is the difference between half a second to get all of that content or three and a half seconds. And so as a developer, that's a challenge that you have to work around is how can I make this page actually be performant? Because no one wants to wait around for three and a half seconds for a web page to load. You know, they'll just quit and go to something else. And so you don't have any control over that as a developer, right? Your users are connecting from wherever they're connecting on whatever device they're connecting with. Maybe they have a really old Android phone that has a slow processor and doesn't support 4G. Maybe they're you know, on the latest uh, you know, iPhone 7, whatever. That's all stuff that you don't have any control over. So there's this other challenge of how can you balance the performance from your side? And particularly when you start using front-end frameworks, there is that challenge of you know, putting a lot of content download up front um, to enab enable a better user experience versus having kind of that content come in more quickly and be performant. Um, so here's another great part. So this is kind of getting on the JavaScript. Um, this is from the State of JS survey, which is a survey that anyone can fill out that just kind of talks about what's it like to be a JavaScript developer. Um, goes around every year. And um, essentially, in this graph, these are each one's a different framework. Um, React, Angular, Angular 2, uh, Ember, View, and Backbone. Uh, pink means I've used it, I've used it again. Uh, green means I haven't heard of it, uh, and I'm not as, if it's a lighter green, I'm not that interested, if it's a darker green, I am interested in using it. Um, as we've, you know, as more development has been happening around the web, the complexity of what people are doing in the front end and how you're managing that state change in applications is increasing. And so these frameworks have all been built up to kind of handle and manage that complexity. And that changes kind of your overall system design where now maybe previously you would have done some things on a server side environment. Maybe you're pushing that into the front end because you, um, either that's where you have development resources or people want to use these frameworks or in some cases, these frameworks might be better at handling that and managing that from a user, per from a user interface perspective. But they all come with those trade-offs of, you know, do I send a bunch of JavaScript to the browser up front in terms of, you know, file size and make a user download that, or do I try and just have them start downloading content straight before? And those are all trade-offs that, as a front-end developer, you have to make. Um, and this has been a really interesting for me between eBay and Blue Apron. So eBay doesn't really use a front-end JavaScript framework beyond jQuery. Um, so we don't use React, don't use Angular, um, whereas a uh, Blaprin, our entire logged in experience is built off of Backbone. We have a lot of other things built off of Ember. And so the conceptual model of like how do you design kind of this entire application and where are you putting in these data changes, um, you know, it's just a different mental model to write your head around. So it's a really interesting transition for me. Uh, cool, last lesson. Everything is going to break at some point and generally not when you want it to. Um, let's take the example of eBay.com. So this is what it looks like. Uh, just take it a couple days ago. This is you know infinite scroll of search results um, based on searches that you're following and some advertising marketing content up top. Uh, here's how that uh, more or less is kind of structured at a very high level. So you have your browser makes a request to an application that returns the HTML for eBay.com. 
uh, it has to call a backend service that does kind of content aggregation from a bunch of different services, two of those being search service and the file service. So the search service returns items. So you know if you want to look up for uh, you know Super Nintendo games, it'll tell you, okay, here's all the Super Nintendo games for sale on eBay that met your criteria. It gets that from the search database. And then the fall service is what we call to say, okay, this user is interested in these searches. You know, they're interested in Super Nintendo games, uh, Lamborghinis, whatever. So about three months after I started, we had an issue where uh, the search database just started having problems. Uh, they more or less got fire. Uh, so search like wasn't working on the site. That propagated to the search service, which spread to the homepage service. So how this kind of manifested, searches were taking a really long time. Uh, the homepage service, when it would call, it was waiting for that long period of time, um, which the homepage application was also waiting for that period of time. And the end result being, uh, you know, it would take up to 30 seconds for the homepage of eBay to load, if it loaded at all. So sometimes it would just flat out disconnect. Sometimes it would take 30 seconds to load, um, which is you know not a great experience. Um, so you know we looked at okay what went wrong? Okay, well we know that the search DB was taking a really long time. Okay, let's uh, maybe just set some timeouts around that, and so we won't wait for more than you know five seconds. If we don't get search results back, we'll just cut it off, and that'll protect us from you know, search going down. Cool. So we did that, we made those changes, and then a few months later, same thing happened with fall service. So the fall service started having the same problem where some issue uh, unrelated to serving the homepage was causing that service to have really long response times, which led to the homepage service having really long response times, which led to the homepage having really long, wrong, long response times. So the same thing. Um, Everything breaks and it will, and if you're not thinking about that as you're kind of building how you're these you know, more complex systems, uh, you'll run into issues like that. And so the first step is once something like that happens, um, your first reaction is gonna be to fix it, that's great, you know, fix it for the short term, but more important is setting up logging, monitoring, and alerting. So without logging and monitoring, you don't actually know what's happening or what's going on. And without that alerting, you can't be informed when something's happening in a way that shouldn't be. And so, when it's possible, log and monitor pretty much everything you can. Log service calls, how long they're taking, what kind of data is getting sent, um, you know, user information is getting sent, everything that you possibly can, if you have the room in a database for it. Uh, and then, once you have that and it's been running for a while, set up alerting to tell you when it's not, when it's outside of the normal round, bounds. So you know, look at the last few weeks or a few months of data uh, that you've you know now been collecting and see, okay, is this, you know, is it reasonable for us to say that the homepage is going to take 30 seconds to load? Probably not. On average, it takes around 800 milliseconds to 1.2 seconds. So if it goes, you know, maybe if it goes about 1.5 seconds, we'll get an alert and we, you know, we'll investigate and see if something's going wrong. The second thing is, so once you have all of that done and you kind of have all of that piece figured out. Start isolating your dependencies. So, you know, in this case, um, we had kind of the, the way that we were calling the search service, there were several different ways that we were calling it, and each of those kind of was for a different use case. So sometimes it was for like, just give us a generic query and we want results back. Sometimes it was, we want more information on these specific items. And both of those had very different response times. And in order for us to actually make sure that we didn't have an issue with if one of those calls failed, we just broke them up into kind of two separate um, services from our from our site, even though we're kind of calling this in endpoint. And once you start isolating that stuff, also start planning for what's going to happen when it goes down. What are the changes that you know? What's that user experience going to be like? Um, what response is going to happen? You know, what, what are you going to do when that stuff goes down? And so what that looks like. In practicality, um, there's actually a framework called Hysterix. It's an open source framework that Netflix put together that really forces you into this mindset of 
uh, you know, what happens if something I want isn't available? What do I do then? And that's just that's how it's built, and it kind of forces you into those sorts of things. Um, so how that looks, uh, how that looks in practicality. So these were some changes that we made at eBay specifically to handle that stuff. So normally everything's working fine. Uh, that's what you'll see on the homepage. Uh, if search service is failing, or if you know for some reason we can't figure out what you're following. We'll show this content, which features kind of curated content that's hand-picked, um, which is also what logged out users see. Um, and this information is all kind of cached, so you know we can actually show a homepage, and like most of the things that people do on the eBay homepage is search or go to my eBay. They can do all of that stuff here. Um, we're not showing search results, but we still have a pretty decent-looking page that users can interact with. Um, what if we can't even get that content? Something's happening with that content. Uh, we have this other page that has pretty much all static content, meaning that that's all like fixed. So if everything's kind of going down, if our backend homepage service is going down, this page is just totally built within the serving the homepage serving application, and you know we can we can give you a homepage that does something that allows you to do what you need to do without having to. Uh, you know, without relying on a bunch of these other services. And if things get even worse and the actual serving application is having issues, you'll see this. Um, to my knowledge, this has not ever been shown at eBay. Uh, if you see it when you're browsing eBay.com, something seriously is going wrong. So, uh, you know, the whole point of this page is it's, it's all fixed content and never changes. Every link on it goes off of the home page so that it takes all of the traffic off of here and allows this page, this application to kind of reboot itself a little bit faster. Uh, and the whole point is just to make it really quick and get you off the home page. And again, it provides search in my eBay, which is what uh, about 65% of the users that come to the eBay homepage use. Um, sweet, so transition, uh, a lot of you are job hunting right now. Hopefully these tips are helpful. Um, for jobs or internships. Uh, first one, get a portfolio. How many people have a GitHub account? Great, that's a good step. That's step number one. Get a GitHub account, um, use it as a portfolio, particularly when you're coming uh, you know, straight out of school and you don't, maybe don't have any experience professionally, it's the best way to show off what you can do and prove that the fact that you, you know, actually can write software when you don't have that experience. Uh, so getting a GitHub account and put a link to it on kind of whatever social media you use, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, but any decent code that you've written on it. So even if it's like homework assignments, side projects, whatever, just put it all on there because it gives people, you know, makes it a lot easier to understand, you know, that A, things that you've worked on and maybe languages that you've used or technologies that you've used. And also, again, kind of the fact that you can write code and you know what you're doing. Uh, if you aren't that familiar with web hosting or you just kind of don't want to spend the time on doing it, GitHub has static site hosting, so you just essentially make a repo in your GitHub account and you set a specific branch and you put in HTML files and they'll just host it on their own. So it's super easy to get set up and because it's on GitHub you can kind of copy other people's portfolios and change them, so it's very easy to do. Uh, set that up on your own URL. Uh, you know, get you know your name.com or .pizza or you know whatever uh, you want to do, um, and set up your portfolio. And if you can, do a blog. You know, try and host a blog on it as well. It's you know one of the things that makes you stand out a lot more is if you know you share some thoughts about you've had about either you know here was a problem I had when I was trying to learn to use React for the first time, or here's this cool thing I made and here's how I built it. Um, that's always interesting for people to read, and it does actually, you know, make you stand out a lot more compared to other candidates. So for me, when I was uh, job hunting for eBay, I got three three URLs. Uh, I have my name.com, I have hirejohnkline.com, and I also got johnkleinisawesome.com. You know, you gotta you gotta wrap your brand. So if you know, you trust if it's in the domain, right? Same <laughs> um, room two. So where to apply? Um, there are a few different, I mean, there's a lot of different companies, like pretty much every company is using software. So 
um, you know, a way you can approach if you're having struggle beyond, you know, thinking beyond just Google and Facebook and you know, Microsoft and the big companies, uh, Amazon. Uh, you know, think about what you would like to be doing, whether that's in a specific industry or just a specific technology. Uh, if you really like working with user experience or kind of the design side of things and making really beautiful experiences for users, front end development is great for that, either mobile or on the web, either one. Uh, if you really like complex logic and kind of hooking things together, back end development is really great for that. And I say back end, meaning it's not just web development. If you want to do like systems development or embedded systems, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of work with that. If you really like algorithms and trying to understand complex sets of data, or you know, get meaning from that. Machine learning and data science is a great way to go um, for those sorts of things. So that can kind of help you narrow down at least kind of what postings you might apply for or companies that you'd be interested in. As far as big companies versus small companies, uh, they're both great and for a lot of different reasons. You know, in a big company, you're probably going to be working with a bigger scale. So eBay, 60 million people a day visit the homepage. That was pretty incredible to like realize that. 60 million people every day are looking at your work. Blade brand, it's a lot less than that. Um, so big company, you'll just get interesting challenges of scale, like how do we make this work in 22 different languages and you know, 200 countries? How do we handle cross-border trade? How do we do currency conversions? You know, all those sorts of things that come with a bigger scale for an international company. Um, you know, going back to that Conway's Law piece, you will have some of those um, things around process and rigor and quality That'll be usually the case at a bigger company. Uh, but you'll get to find more complex systems, and generally, as well, bigger companies have uh, more ability to pay in terms of real money, either you know, through base salary or uh, stock units. Um, compared to smaller companies you know, or startups, um, one of the great things about a startup is you'll ship a lot of code. You know, uh, at eBay, we we're deploying about once every two weeks. Um, which is kind of the standard at Blaperin, uh, we're deploying multiple times a day. So we're shipping a lot of code, we're pushing a lot of things out there. That's really nice. Um, you know, a lot of times you have the flexibility to learn new technologies. You know, it's like, hey, we have this thing that our users want, um, you know, go forth and build it. And if you think that a particular technology or language is gonna be really helpful for that, you generally have the freedom to do that. Uh, you get to work on a lot of different parts. So maybe one day you're working on the payments platform, Maybe another day you're working on kind of the front end. Uh, another day you might be working on just database maintenance. You know, there's that flexibility of smaller companies where you can, you know, if that's interested to you, you can, you know, do those sorts of things. Uh, and on the pay side, you maybe aren't going to get as much and say your base salary. You might get options, but there is that upside of, you know, if the company gets big, you know, you can cash out that way. So, um, you know, that's the pay side. It's a little bit riskier for smaller companies, but. You know, if you're willing to put in the work, that can happen. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of different kinds of companies or areas where it will work, uh, how to apply. Um, hopefully, everyone knows this, but uh, if you can get a reference, do that. So it doesn't matter how loose that connection is, your chance of your resume getting seen is significantly higher if you know someone at the company either through like LinkedIn or someone you met at a meetup or you know, a friend, whatever, that greatly increases your odds. And most companies take references very seriously. So you know, generally references are seen at and looked at a lot more quickly and better than just kind of a, you know, applying to the website or something like that. Uh, when you're getting your interviews, um, take the time and study for them. It, probably is a lot easier coming straight out of school for some of these technical interviews because most of them focus on algorithms and data structures, which um, you'll have hopefully been working on you know, in your last four years at SU, but generally once you get in industry, you're not working as in depth on that. So that should be a little bit easier, but definitely take the time and study. Look up you know, Google common interview problems, look up on Glassdoor for the company that you're applying and see if they have any if anyone's posted their problems there and practice it, you know, actually try and write out a solution, look online for answers, understand how those work. Uh, if you get your friends to do practice interviews, if you have friends that are in the profession and uh, you know are working and want to do an interview for you, you know, help them do that. It just helps you kind of get used to interview settings where you're getting asked a lot of questions or maybe being thought to work through a hard problem. Um, you know, I think one of the greatest skills is being able to kind of stay calm under pressure. And so when you get 
asked a really, really hard problem that you have no idea how to solve. Uh, just being able to explain what's going on, what your thought process is, and how you're thinking about solving it is a huge skill that makes a really big difference in interviews. Uh, and know what the company like. Know the company that you're applying to. Look at what their mission is. What kind of software they write. Um, you know, look at their background or their history. You know, try and get a good understanding of what it is you're going into, and you know, kind of the culture that you're going to be going into. And have some questions ready for your interviewers. Um, this resource is really great. Uh, this is from Cassie Williams. Her Twitter handle is Cassie Do. She's a developer evangelist for Clarify, which does um, kind of machine learning image recognition. And she wrote this getting a gig guide, it's on GitHub, and I'll put the link to these slides on the Facebook event. Um, so you can get this, but it's really good, and it goes a lot more in detail on a lot of this other stuff. Um, some really good websites as well, Hired, it's a great place to put your profile up. It's very competitive for uh, candidates, so you're gonna get seen by a lot more companies and have a higher likelihood of interviewing. Um, I saw articles on Medium about just kind of interviewing in general, and. Um, a lot of companies have their engineering blogs on there, so you can get, it's a great resource for finding out about companies or you know, finding out how to ace interviews. Uh, Code Wars is a really good site to practice kind of interview type problems. So you can go out, they just have a bunch of different problems and solutions and you can write code and you know, try and solve it and you know, see how that compares. And then Glassdoor, again, really a resource people submit reviews of like, hey, I interviewed this company, here are the three problems they asked, everyone was really nice or everyone was kind of mean or you know, whatever, it gives you some background about what that's actually like in the process. Cool. Um, talking a little bit about kind of where uh, I think things are going, and a lot of this was, was pretty interesting. Uh, when I was interviewing earlier this year before I came to Blaper, and I was talking to a lot of different companies, and um, it was a really great kind of perspective gathering experience because I think when you're working somewhere you kind of get focused in your vision. Um, the first one, software is eating the world. I think most people have probably heard this. Uh, Mark Andreessen said it in 2011. It was five years ago. Uh, it's still just as applicable now if not more so than it was then. Pretty much every company is a tech company. Every company needs some sort of specialized software to help them do their job, to help them be more competitive. Every company is writing software and needs software developers more or less. Some of the companies that I interviewed with, um, you know, these are tech companies, seen as tech companies, but none of them really are. Uh, Maple is a food delivery um, company in New York City. Uh, they, they, they're not like Seamless or Grubhub where they partner with restaurants. They are the restaurant and the delivery, so they do the whole thing. They source their food, prepare it, cook it, and send it out to you. They're writing an AI to help them pretty much with every part of their business. So they wrote their own AI to better manage how their deliveries work, to better put carrier, you know, the delivery people to better plan their routes and how many meals they should take and how long their order window should stay open at buildings if someone's already ordered there. All of that's handled kind of automatically through this AI that they've built. But at the end of the day, they're, they're a food delivery company, but they're seen as a tech company because of this. Eloquy is a really interesting company. They uh, used to be kind of a brand of Limited that was uh, Limited, the fashion company that um, focuses on fashion for plus size women. And Limited went bankrupt and shut down. They restarted Eloquy because it was an online first business. So they don't have any stores, you can just order online. And part of their advantage is they can bring fashion trends to the mass market six or nine months faster than all their competitors. So in the fashion world, it takes like 12 months from, for something to get like from a runway to you know, Target or uh, Macy's or whatever. They were doing it in like half the time. And that's purely because of the technology that they're using to, on the manufacturing side, to like source and you know, assemble that to their delivery side where you know, it's all online. They can focus more on how can we create a really great experience and get things to our customers faster. Blaprin, uh, you know, we're seen as a tech company, but really we're just a big food company. We're not the first company that's delivered food nationwide to people's doors. But what we're doing differently is, you know, we work directly with farmers to source our food. We give them information about cl their climate and their specific area. We like test their soil to understand what are the crops that are best going to be grown in their rotation. We match that with the things that we need. Several months later, we handle all of our own logistics pretty much own 
the entire supply chain and all the technology that we write for that is all custom built. And so, you know, we're a food company, but we're enabled and we've gotten as big as we have because we're really good at operations and we're really good at technology. Betterment, they do automated financial investing and kind of mass market. So you just put money up there. You say, I am okay with this being really risky. I'm not okay with this being risky. You just create an account and they handle doing all this automated investing for you. They do a lot of like tax harvesting so that you can minimize your uh, tax uh, liabilities on your investments. All automated, all driven by technology, but you know, they're a finance company. Eve is really interesting. They're another company that I interviewed with. They are working on kind of making the mortgage, mortgage process like actually human. So right now, if you want to get a mortgage, you have to you know, go talk to a bank and go talk to a lawyer and go talk to a mortgage broker and the whole process might take up to a month before you actually get approved for a mortgage. They can do it in a few days using machine learning on previous mortgage applications and they're kind of cutting out the entire middle layer where they're dealing directly with people that are funding mortgages um, to make that process easier. So they're a tech company, but they're also a mortgage company. A lot of the more popular ones, Tesla, Uber, Warby Parker, you know, those are kind of the more common tech companies where really they're just the new representation of what business looks like in their respective industries. There's never been a better time to be a software engineer. The tools and capabilities that we have to change people's lives is, you know, never been seen before. Um, it's so easy to just create a new application or a new, you know, create a new app that'll really help people. Um, there's also everyone needs software developers. Every company, you know, is a tech company, and the demand for engineers and software developers is only going to go up for the next. 10 years and you know the supply particularly in the US is not going to meet that and so the job security is going to be there for quite a while there's a lot of initiatives like CS for all that are you know trying to start getting people into technology earlier on but that's going to take many years to come about and soft the need for software is only going to keep going uh, and that so you know in this kind of every business is a tech business Forbes again did that in 2011 and that was kind of before the advent of machine learning and data science becoming kind of a normal part of business. And what that really changed is that the next 100 years is really going to be an information revolution in terms of what are we doing with all this data that we're gathering and what insights are we learning from that. So, you know, we had the Industrial Revolution around the turn of the last century that kind of transitioned into the digital revolution that we've been in for the last you know, 40 years. Uh, now we're getting into this kind of information revolution where based on all of the, everything before us, and the fact that we have all these really great systems that help us collect huge amounts of data, and we can store that very quickly and process it very quickly, uh, that's gonna be what drives humanity and business forward. Uh, this, was, this was a really cool thing that I found, um, a study that was done uh, essentially, in 1992, there was about 100 gigs of data getting generated every day. Five years later, it was 100 gigs every hour. Five years after that, it was 100 gigs every second. Uh, in 2013, kind of 11 years, it was 28,000 gigs per second. Uh, in 2018, the prediction was 50,000 gigs per second, which comes out to about four exabytes every day. Um, that's the amount of data that's getting produced. There's a ton of it. Uh, the crazier thing, we're able to store it, and we're able to store it really cheaply. Uh, and every business going forward is going to need to be able to do something with that data or be able to collect it and understand it in order for them to remain competitive. Not even just be you know, better than their competitors, but to just stay even. Um, this is a kind of how cheap that's gotten. This is a logarithmic scale here. And so the curve kind of looks you know, normal. This is the cost per gigabyte for a hard drive since 1980, but you know, if you were to chart it on a normal graph, it wouldn't fit in this building, probably. Uh, so storage has gotten super cheap. Um, processing it has gotten really cheap. CPU processing costs have gone down. Bandwidth and network capabilities have all gone up. And so our ability to just kind of pull in all of this data and actually do something with it is you know, increasing exponentially every day. And the next two decades, the most valuable skill set you could have is being able to help companies get that data, collect it, and do something with it. And 
that you know how we've been thinking about that in the industry is machine learning, neural networks, and really that's kind of the only way to actually understand that much data at a given time. And where you know kind of what's the point of all that? So the next you know there's about three billion people that are online today. So about three billion people have access to a computing device, whether that's a smartphone or an actual PC or you know, you know, kind of full-on computer. Um, the next couple billion people that are going to come online are not anything like everyone that's been online so far. Uh, this was from a talk that Google did at Google I.O. earlier this year, um, just kind of a heat map of users that are online. And as you can see, they're pretty much all from India and China, um, a lot of South Asia, Africa, and Brazil. And thinking about the just demographics of that, um, most of those users are going to be on a mobile device. That's the cheapest way to get that hardware. You can get an Android phone in India for 30 bucks that you know, allows you to get online and do the things that Android lets you do. Uh, the demographics and life experiences of those people are totally different. Right? Like the average person in India does not have the same life experience that the average person in the US or Europe has had. And most of the software that's been written to date has largely been by relatively wealthy white men for relatively wealthy other white men. And that kind of creates this situation where we're not actually solving some of the big problems of the world that are having an impact on people's lives. And so I challenge you that as a software developer with you know, this incredibly powerful skill set that you've been building on for the last four years, there is that opportunity to make a difference for these next two billion people. Some examples of that, uh, HeatSeek uh, was a, uh, a project that kind of built these devices that people in public housing would put in their apartments and it would just monitor the temperature. And one of the things that happens a lot in New York City is that public housing owners will not keep the heat on to save money over the winter. And so there is a law that says you have to keep uh, an apartment above 50 degrees or 55 degrees, which is not that warm. Um, and people would complain, but they had no kind of recourse to prove it. And so this allowed them to actually do that and track that in specific apartments. And so that has a real impact on you know, people being able to stay warm in the winter. We Farm is a, a company that allows people to share information through SMS, specifically around farming. And so you know, on a lot, most of the farmers of the world don't have access to the internet. They have cell phones, but they don't have internet. And so, you know, being able to draw on that body of knowledge that's in the internet to actually make yourself a better farmer, there isn't really a way for them to do that until now. So now they can actually talk to other farmers through SMS and you know get a better understanding of how are crops doing, how's your, you know, how's a drought, I'm having this problem, how can I work on it better? Where at uh, was a, a project that one of my friends have started. Um, it's an app that, you know, kind of based on a lot of the Black Lives Matters and um, other protests that have been going on around the world over the last couple of years, is really focused at helping people connect and organize securely. So it allows people to share their location over a secure channels so that it can't be listened on by police or the FBI or anything like that, and also have a chat, you know, to allow people to organize without getting uh, monitored. Uh, and, you know, at a bigger level, Code for America is a really great program, for those of you that are familiar, it allows you to uh, spend a year doing software development for public service. So you'll work with, uh, in Code for America, you work with local, state, or federal governments to kind of build some software or work on some problem for them um, for a year, and, you know, it gives that opportunity to kind of give back in a, in a public way that isn't necessarily for a company. So, you know, as I said, as software engineers, we have this really great ability to, you know, transform people's lives. You know, Facebook reached over a billion people and has allowed them to connect in ways that has never been possible in human history. Um, as Jesuit educated software engineers, by coming to this school, you know, there's that extra challenge of how, what are we doing to help those that are less fortunate and to help, you know, make their lives better. And so I'll leave you with this question of, you know, coming from that background of being these incredibly skilled and talented individuals and having this, you know, challenge to go forth and help those that need it the most, you know, what's your impact going to be?
Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, are you willing? Um, I know some people have to go at 120, and that's fine. But are you, are you willing to take questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, does anyone have questions? Yeah. What, what, are, what, are thoughts on get, what are your thoughts on getting a master's degree? Yeah, great question. Um, I think they're really great. So um, a lot of the things that I kind of picked up at eBay, I would have been a lot better at had I gotten a master's, um, just through the, like, the course content alone. Um, I think it's also a really good opportunity to kind of have that more focused study into a specific area that you're interested in. Like particularly if you want to do machine learning or something like that, like your average CS program isn't going to quite get you all the way there. So a master's program is really great that. Um, I think it's great. Working in the industry is also good. Um, you know, it's really kind of more of do you want that intense, intense focus academic study um, or do you want to, you know, start working somewhere. It's really, you know, to your personal interests. Yeah. I have kind of the opposite question. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm an electrical engineering student and I've taken a full programming classes up to the data, data structures. Um, I have a number of friends in industry um, from all different backgrounds, EE, physics, like, and so on. Yeah. Um, I guess what do you, if you have a candidate who doesn't have a CS background, what are you concerned about with that candidate? And what, like, like what's your advice for someone who's like suddenly very interested in getting a software job who hasn't spent four years developing that strong skill set? Yeah, for sure. Um, my personal opinion is I'm generally pretty flexible. If you've done some code before and you know how to solve problems, you're going to be fine. Um, Full Apron, fortunately, shares that same attitude. Uh, my team at eBay did that. We had someone who was working in like avionic systems doing kind of uh, more, I guess, computer engineering, but he had an electrical engineering background. Kind of went through that way. Um, you know, your biggest challenge is going to be familiar, familiarity with technologies. And so kind of your pitch should be more focused around like I have some, you know, understanding. Like I've done programming, I know some of that. I maybe aren't as focused as a software engineer, but I'm really good at solving problems and, you know, coming at it from that perspective. And I think that's where more, you know, even studying for an interview and um, yeah. being able to speak to that is going to, you know, have a lot bigger. So there, there's there's some um, willingness to, to like meet meet the person for sure. really halfway on that. Yeah, okay. I think particularly if you have like an engineering background, period. Um, you know, most engineering and physics students are writing some sort of you know, Python or R or something. It's, so everyone has kind of that basis in programming at least, and so a lot of, most companies are pretty open to you know alternative backgrounds. We'll say. Yeah. Uh, in your JS slide, you showed a bunch of frameworks. Uh, as a manager, how do yeah. you? <laughs> How is someone supposed to have those skill sets, like every single of those? And like, yeah. yeah. Um, generally, I mean, most companies are generally using one of those frameworks. Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, knowledge of a framework doesn't necessarily make you a great software developer and vice versa. Um, so as a manager, particularly like hiring, you know, hiring or less concerned necessarily about particular practical experience unless we're looking for someone that has like for a mid or senior level position. Um, you know, as a manager, like my, most managers want to help their people develop, and so if someone has interest in learning something or like, you know, being able to learn Angular or React is going to be a really big skill set for you in your next position. So, you know, most people are willing to help people get to that point where they can you know, work on that and develop it. But I think most, no one has a really in-depth understanding of all those frameworks. Maybe they have one or two. Um, most companies are using like React and Angular probably by far, and so you know, looking more practically, if that's something that you're interested in doing, like having a good understanding of one of those is definitely fine. Yeah, Tom, the very first thing you said was that developing software is mostly about people. Yeah. You know, we, when we hear about interviews, the main thing that people talk about is the how, how much do you know about algorithms, data structures. Mm -hmm. So is that a mismatch, or is there something they're looking for in the way you answer that question? The the key there. Yeah, that's a that's a great. Yeah, I had not. So I read this article yesterday actually about um, interviewing.io did this um, their website that allows you to do practice interviews. I probably should put that on the slide, but. You can like sign up and you anonymous, anonymously practice interviews with kind of random people. And basically, kind of based on their study, they found that most technical interviews didn't actually do a good job of, um, 
either like making people feel like they were doing a good job or kind of relating to what you're doing at your you know day-to-day -day sort of thing. And so when I say technical interview, that's generally like you know problem solving through an algorithm or something like that. And I think part of what I think about when I'm interviewing and you know and working through a problem with someone is less about um, can they come to a correct solution or not in a short period of time and more about kind of those how do they work with other people as they're solving that problem so you know do they get frustrated really easily and you know kind of get angry and, and you know that's difficult to work with on a day-to-day -day basis um, are they thinking about a problem in a way that's pretty easy to understand and can they explain what they're thinking about in a way that I can pick it up and so it's kind of you know a lot of those algorithm problems and interviews are really less about you know some of it's about like checking that you know a particular language and some of the syntax around it you know some of that basic stuff but a lot of it you know kind of the bigger qualifiers or disqualifiers are going to be around you know how well did you explain yourself um, you know how frustrated like how easily frustrated are you what do you do when you run into something that you don't know which kind of are more exemplary of the like people side of things yeah did that answer yeah, your question great are there any other questions yeah do you um so what ultimately led you to Blue Apron to, and like why, why did you end up choosing the Blue Apron? Yeah, great question. Uh, so at eBay, uh, I kind of plateaued a bit on, in terms of my personal growth, so I want to start taking on more responsibility. I was leading, you know, kind of had been leading the one team for a couple of years and coming into 2016 I was going to be doing a lot of the same stuff that I had done previously. And so I kind of wanted to grow and take on more responsibility and that wasn't going to happen on more or less wasn't gonna happen on a time frame that I wanted. So I started looking elsewhere, and what really drew me to Blue Apron was, one, is a company that's growing really quickly, so we have 60 engineers, and we're gonna double that in the next year. Um, as a business, we've, uh, I think at the beginning of 2016, we were shipping three million meals a month. Now we're shipping eight million meals a month. Um, so just business as a whole is growing, so that opportunity for me to kind of level up as a manager, you know, and start having more teams and that sort of thing is just kind of built into how it works. But what attracted me the most was, Blayburn's alignment on values with kind of my personal values as a manager. And so Blayburn's company values, their stated values are empowerment, quality, uh, lifelong learning, trust, and teamwork. And empowerment and teamwork and lifelong learning are, you know, my, that's the teams that I want to build, that's what I want to do. And so one, that, that alignment was there, but more importantly, when I actually went and interviewed, everybody that I talked to was on the same page about those values. And so kind of having everything like click and come together was, very unique and what you know, made it a pretty obvious choice for me. Yeah. Um, in regards to your first couple of interviews and jobs, I've been, t I've been told, I, uh, that's what got down was kind of mixed, but should you try to hone in on something that you hone in on something or can, or, or at, during the beginning are you at a point where or typically people are at a point where they can't afford to be picky about, oh, I, oh about, about basically doing a job that doesn't really suit their major. Uh, so can you say that again? I'm just a bit confused. Like, um, should you be picking on what kind of interview, internships you get if you're just starting out, or should you apply for any? Oh, should you be picky or not, more or less. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, to a degree. I, you know, I, I think that's, I think you know, the reason I took Blade Print was you know, less so because of their technology and stuff, and more so about the people that I was going to be working with. And you're gonna be you're gonna be way happier at a job if you like the people you're working with and the problems that you're solving. And so, you know, be picky in that regards at least of you know, do the people you talk to when you're interviewing, are they nice and friendly and sound like people you want to work with? And are they, you know, at least solving some interesting problems that you might want to do? So I'd be picky in that regards, but in terms of, you know, maybe industry, I think particularly if you're looking at internships, you know, explore. It's a great time to do something that you wouldn't normally otherwise. Um, if you're looking at a full-time job, you know, the reality is most people only spend a couple of years at a company. Um, it's not great to necessarily go in with that mindset, but um, at the end of the, you know, if those things are in place where, you know, the people are great and the problems sound interesting, you know, that's enough, I would say, exploring. So kind of applying to a lot of different companies is not going to hurt. Um, but, you know, as you start getting further in the interview process, that, that, that's what I would suggest you have as your guiding, you know, kind of what guides your decision. 
So uh, part of my senior design project is working on a mobile app. And this mobile app is for a demographic of people that I know nothing about. It's for commercial truckers. Yeah. And it's about user experience. So I guess in a broad sense, what sort of um, advice could you give to someone who is launching a platform for, for a group of people you have no idea about? Yeah. Um, you have to, you got to talk to them. I mean, either like that's, you know, how do you get access to them? Um, you know, in theory, are you, are you doing it with Packer, I'm yeah. guessing? Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that they have just dis like distribution networks, people that are like selling the trucks that they're building and stuff. Like, go talk to those companies, have them put you in touch with people that are buying it, you know, use that chain. You go like put ads on Craigslist, or like, hey, we want to do, we're like doing this study, we have 20 bucks if you, you know, take an hour long phone call with us or something like that. Like, that's how, like, you're really only ever going to get good feedback if you actually talk to the people that are going to use it. So, Trying to think of some of those like guerrilla tactics to reach those people is, you know, what I would suggest. Like, just figure that out. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's no, yeah. helpful. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Do you work with the for the? So you're part of the team that use your acquisition, right? Yeah. Do you work on the onboarding process as well? Yeah. So yeah. So my team owns registration and onboarding for Blue Apron. Yeah. Any uh, useful tips? Any cool things that you discovered that really help increase user acquisition? Yeah, um, less so Blue Apron because we really just started kind of getting into it in the last um, month or so. Of you know, the process, the onboarding flow hasn't really changed all that much at Blue Apron. Um, some interesting things that I learned at eBay and through you know a few different meetups. I went to meet up with um, uh, an app called Cover, which I don't think I've ever made it out here, but it was like a restaurant payments app. So you would essentially say you're at a restaurant, and then that was it. Like you say you're at the restaurant, and then you tell your waiter that. You're paying with cover, and then that you like never see the bill. Uh, you just kind of leave whenever you're done, which is cool. Um, I mean, generally, like less steps is better. Uh, so, like minimizing the amount of steps that someone has to complete as they go through it is always going to give you a lot better conversion. And also having kind of a gradual, only asking for the information that is absolutely necessary. So eBay did a really interesting change where uh, about three years ago they. Before that, when you wanted to do anything that required a, an account on eBay, you had to give them your name, your email, shipping address, credit card number, zip code, phone number, kind of all of the information that you would need to make a purchase. Even if you just want to like, you know, save this search and start getting email updates when new things get posted. And so they switched to, okay, well, we're only going to ask for that information when you actually go to buy something, but any other time we'll just get your email and create a password and create an account and that's it. And you know the amount of kind of people that they had complete that overall sign-up flow went up like threefold or something like that. So you know, really thinking about what's the minimum amount of information that I need to allow the user to do something. Blade Run's kind of tricky because it's a subscription service. So at a minimum, we need your credit card address, name, you know, phone number, that sort of thing. And so our problem. Our biggest challenge is going to be, you know, how can we make that flow where we're getting all of that information from you a lot easier and a lot more seamless. Fortunately, kind of going back to the front end thing, like Chrome and uh, Apple Pay both have these really great hookins where if you have Apple Pay set up on your phone or if you have your an address in your Chrome address book, you can plug into an API on the browser and have it auto populate that stuff. So it just creates a little bit better flow. So that's going to be something that we'll look into. But you know, those sorts of things are. Cool. All right, well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Uh, next week, we're having a, another talk, actually, by the CEO of Deja Vu Security. Uh, he's going to talk about his life and how he ended up becoming the CEO of that company. Uh, and the talk sounds actually really interesting, so I encourage you all to come. We'll have free dominoes um, at that meeting. So, more free food. Um, I think we actually ran out of all the sandwiches, which is amazing. So, um, yeah, well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That was great.